Continuing to walk you through the Dragon spacecraft, opposite of that nose cone, it's right down the middle with the left side black and the right side white. Uh, the trunk provides an attachment point to Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and can carry any cargo uphill. On the outside, one half of the trunk contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system into space using SpaceX's new PICA tiling technology. The other half contains solar cells that are used to charge the spacecraft's batteries during flight. Spacecraft. SpaceX Dragon, Bob and I are go for launch. And you heard that call out right Copy. there? Copy, go for launch. Next up will be the go no go pull at T minus 45. Bob and Doug are go for launch and next up. We're holding in step six decimal five. <laughs> You're hearing it live from the Mets. This is amazing, very exciting. The SpaceX is designed the spacecraft is designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be no. removed and Our replaced go. by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and will be custom sized for any crew members flying on board. That control panel that's centered between the pilot and commander seats consists of three touchscreen displays, and that just again allows the crew to operate the vehicle and fly it manually, but also look at all of their procedures, relative position over the Earth, the space station, any alarms, alerts, anything that they could possibly want to do on Dragon is through those touchscreens. <laughs> and lastly, our Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. And that launch escape system was put into work a little bit earlier this year, again, on that in-flight abort test. As we look to the future beyond this test flight, the first operational SpaceX crewed mission for NASA will be a little bit later this year after Bob and Doug come home. NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Suichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, were chosen to support this mission being called Crew-1. But today, Doug Hurley is the spacecraft commander for this mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions as the pilot on STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final Ready space four, shuttle flight. Here's a closer look at launch. Doug Hurley. Please review your launch commit criteria. Again, this is uh, to review and confirm no violation of launch commit criteria. We are tracking excited. one issue Very excited. with uh, yeah. Very weather excited. still. And I think oh, yeah. we'll need I to track that ready. all the way down uh, to uh, launch to uh, clear that. This pull is also go for arming and launch escape system and uh, go for propellant load. And this is he on countdown, countdown net reporting that uh, the technical pull was completed. All systems are proceeding during the weather as LD briefed. We're also looking at a uh, watch item on a hydraulics QD rod ring. Uh, ring pressure will come up at minus 8 minutes 30 seconds, and we'll be able to verify decay rate. No concerns at this time. Everything's reading nominal, uh, but watching that item. Uh, no other constraints on Falcon 9 or ground systems. Stage two, RP-1 bleed is complete. All right, we just crossed the 55-minute mark away from launch. Sitting right next to Doug Hurley, who's closest to your screen, is NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. 
He's the net, he is the Joint Operations Commander for Demo-2, and Bankin previously flew on two space shuttle missions, STS-123 and STS-130, and also served a tour as Chief of the Astronaut Office. So here's a little bit more about the man who said testing out a brand new spacecraft is an astronaut's dream. When you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's gonna take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and you know we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to you know, collect the data. We hear a sound, okay, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light, is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavour twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000, uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. There's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board you feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know and then somebody of course that's a family member it's even multiplied more. For me personally as a spouse watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years um, the dedication that he's shown the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, I'm helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this. Now there's another capability in the US besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's, it's been several decades. Now we're in a time when we've got started. multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time.
On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire Commercial Crew Program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles in the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. We're just over 49 and a half minutes away from launch of the Falcon 9 carrying Dragon to the space station. Right now the launch director and the launch team are preparing for a readiness for launch poll. In this poll, the 13 members of the launch team will electronically indicate a go for launch. This is also the go for propellant load. Now we're going to hear that in a couple of minutes, so while we wait, we are tracking you watching from all over the country. We're seeing large numbers of you logging on or tuning in from coast to coast, as well as around the world. We want to know, is this your first time watching a launch live? If not, how many have you seen before? Tell us using the hashtag LaunchAmerica from your favorite social media website. As for me, this isn't my first one. I've seen a lot, but everyone is exciting. Now coming up, we're going to go into a readiness poll, as I mentioned. Currently right now on other nets, the SpaceX launch director is checking to verify the Dragon team is ready and that the NASA launch management team is ready. They'll come back uh, at about T minus 47 minutes with instructions to the SpaceX Falcon 9 team to make their final assessments. Then they log into the procedure. It's a little different than the old days where you would hear a go, 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 you know, position by position all up and down the row. Uh, in this electronic age, everybody just clicks on uh, whether they're go or no go. The launch director will then at T minus 45 minutes summarize the end of the poll and will then provide instructions for the team. At the same time, we will begin getting ready for the crew access arm retraction, and we'll show you that on one of the uh, screens that we've got up. Now currently, we are continuing to monitor the weather. The weather is still red. It is improving. We're looking at one cell between the radar and the pad. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that conditions will improve, but we're going to be watching that for about another 15 minutes. So it looks like we're going to be good to begin propellant load once we hear the poles, but we still have to get the uh, final, get the range green so that we can actually do the launch in just 47 minutes from now. Let's listen to the countdown net for a moment. Right now, coming up on 46 minutes, 10 seconds before launch. Didn't hear any significant chatter coming over countdown one. Yes, launch director in the countdown net. Pull is complete, and we have a go to proceed with propellant load. Launch control, proceed with swing into crew arm. Arming crew arm movement for T minus 45 minutes. Thank you, launch control. A reminder in control room on hold and launch escape protocol for non-urgent no-go conditions, brief CE or LD, and it will approve aborting the launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. Remainder on fire alarm instructions here in fire room four, event of a fire alarm, key operators, previously briefed, will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. 
In the event that personal safety is threatened, we will evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. One final reminder, we'll be arming the launch escape system momentarily. We need all personnel, please stay in your seats from now through orbit insertion and dragon separation from the second stage. Rear access arm retract has started. And you've heard Mike Taylor, the SpaceX launch director, give instructions to the team. We've also just heard the call. The crew access arm retraction is underway. Great view from the camera inside the white room. As we see the arm moving away from the Dragon capsule, one of the major events necessary to get down to T0. The next one coming up will be arming of the escape system on the Dragon capsule. Now right now the next plan for Falcon 9, T minus 35 minutes, we will begin loading propellant onto the first and second stages. Now currently, Falcon 9's looking good, Dragon's looking good. The range continues to be go for launch in terms of the clearance around the uh, launch pad, both the air and the sea space. Looking at the flight corridor, the ground stations, uh, the NASA tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support. And we just continue to monitor the weather. Uh, our team is getting constant updates. We're monitoring uh, weather uh, data sensors around the launch site, looking to make sure that we can get everything into the green position. The one that we're mostly looking at right now is how much rain we're going to get between now and liftoff, uh, whether it's just going to be mild precipitation that's within the uh, rules for loading propellant, uh, that's what the expectation is, but we're going to continue to watch that. So fingers crossed, but right now coming up at uh, T-minus 43 minutes, 18 seconds and counting, everything but the weather's go, and the weather is trending in the right direction. So we've got our fingers crossed here. At this time, we're going to send it back over to Kennedy Space Center as the action is picking up on the launch pad. Thanks, John I. Now that countdown clock is continuing to tick and we are 42 minutes and 46 seconds away from launch. Now, as you just saw, the crew arm retracted. That is the last major visual milestone before liftoff. And we should be hearing out on the net soon's confirmation that the launch escape system is armed. When that happens, all eight of the Super Draco throttle valves are opened, which means that those engines can ignite. For section seven. Okay. So that means those, thro those uh, eight uh, throttle valves are opened, and if those Super Dracos needed to fire in order for a Dragon to escape off of the pad, they could. And so things running just a little bit ahead of schedule right now. Field lead is complete. Now we just saw the crew access arm track just a minute ago. We saw NASA astronauts Doug Hurley. And in uh, seven decimal two, our visors are closed and we're arming the launch escape system. So we just heard the astronauts confirm that they are about to launch, or excuse me, arm the launch escape system. That happens just before fueling begins, which we expect to happen in just a couple of minutes. We saw Bob and Doug suit up a little over three hours ago. Then we watched them drive out to Launch Complex 39A. They were assisted by the SpaceX ground team with Crew Dragon Ingress. That happened a little before 2 o'clock this afternoon. And then we saw the spacecraft hatch close. And again, just a minute ago, we saw the crew access arm retract. We just heard that the crew armed the launch escape system. And in just a few minutes, we are going to uh, hear the call that they have started propellant loading. Launch escape system is verified armed. So we just heard that verification that the launch escape system is armed. We're switching to GN2. And we are going to send it over to Hawthorne uh, to take us through prop loading. Jesse? 
From the parachutes to the launch escape system, SpaceX has de designed Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 to be the safest vehicle, launch vehicle ever flown. And joining us today, we have SpaceX's Nick Pacone, who was our mission manager for our in-flight abort uh, mission earlier this year and currently works on the Starlink team. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Hey, Jesse. I'm here at the Launch and Landing Recovery Center with the recovery team and our Dragon Ground Operations team monitoring the launch. Awesome. Can you tell us more about the critical safety features on this new version of Dragon? Sure. So Dragon 2 was designed with long-term reuse and reliability in mind. So fundamentally, there are multiple layers of redundancy to any of the failure modes that, that we could conceive of, that NASA could conceive of uh, when we were working to design and test this vehicle over the past few years. But in the event that we encounter an unforeseen failure mode or multiple failures which push us outside of our design space, Dragon also has backup systems and operational controls intended to keep Bob and Doug safe. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it today, but the launch escape system is primar the primary uh, backup system that we have from the moment that the vehicle is here on that being fueled uh, all the way up until orbital insertion. Um, at a high level, uh, the launch escape system in the event of a major Falcon anomaly or emergency will terminate Falcon thrust, separate Dragon from Falcon, and it'll use Dragon's eight Super Draco engines to quickly pull the vehicle away from any kind of Falcon anomaly. And you talked a lot about the launch escape system. How exactly is that activated? Is it autonomous? Is it manually activated? Definitely. So for this system to work as designed, you have to remember that the vehicle could be flying at hundreds or thousands of miles an hour through the lower atmosphere. So it's really important that it's a extremely fast and highly reliable with very low chance of false positives. Uh, the launch escape system fundamentally is set to look at a set of pre-programmed criteria which are on board the vehicle. Dragon and Falcon are looking at high rate telemetry, um, looking for abnormal vehicle dynamics, loss of communication between critical systems, um, or manual commanding. Our launch director and chief engineer, who you've heard a lot from today, are capable of sending a manual command uh, to Dragon to initiate a launch escape. And Bob and Doug are also always able to, uh, to actuate the launch escape handle and, and initiate a launch escape themselves as well. Um, now that the system is armed, um, all of this is currently active on the vehicle. Wow, it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. And we did have an in-flight abort test earlier this year to test this out. Can you tell us what we learned from that test? Definitely. Uh, it was possibly the, the most flight-like test of an orbital class booster um, in history. Uh, it was a fully flight-like test using a full Falcon 9 rocket, which we had to knowingly destroy um, in order to get this fully integrated system. Um, for folks who didn't get a chance to see it, uh, the vehicle followed a normal crew launch trajectory about a minute and a half into flight. Uh, we had Dragon autonomously trigger the launch escape system based on a, a reconfiguration of those triggers that I was just talking about. Um, and load. thankfully we had... Uh, we, uh, we continued through flight, um, had a successful parachute deployment and splashdown, um, and we did see Falcon rather spectacularly blow up um, about 10 seconds after separation. Um, it's uh, important to recognize that all of that happens uh, from command to actual separation of the vehicle in under half a second. Wow, yeah, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us and talking through those details with us. Enjoy the launch today. So we're gonna send it back to KSC with Lauren. Thank you, Jesse. We are about a minute and a half away from propellant load. At T minus 35 minutes, we should hear the call out on the nets that propellant load has started. So that's about a minute and 13 seconds away. Hi, hey, Marie and Lauren. I am getting goosebumps over here. This is uh, an exciting moment. Uh, when I was sitting in the vehicle, when we retracted everything, when all the load, the prop was getting loaded up, I was just uh, going through my crew notebook. I was thinking about, you know, what my first step would be if there was a malfunction, because usually everything goes nominally when you fly to space, but you have to think about the things that you have to take care of, you know, the first steps you have to take care of. And on my mission, I was calling out the ab abort calls, like if we had lost an engine, where would we go next, when the different abort calls around the country and around the world. So I think that's what those guys are probably thinking about now, and uh, just really getting ready for this, this mission to go, go off. Absolutely, and we're just now about 20 seconds from 
when we expect propellant loading to start. Again, that's fueling of the rocket. All right, we're getting close. We should hear that call out any second now on the nets. So let's listen in. Propellant load has started. Fantastic. So prop load has started. We've started loading liquid oxygen on stage one and stage two. Um, and yeah, liquid oxygen and RP1, which is our rocket grade kerosene. So now that we are 34 minutes and 42 seconds away from the first launch of astronauts into orbit from American soil since 2011, we know that the launch escape system is armed, which happened just before fueling. Dragon prop load happened weeks ago, actually just a few miles, miles down the road at what we call Dragon Land. And those propellants, which are MMH or monomethyl hydrogen, that's our fuel, and NTO, or nitrogen tetraoxide, that's our oxidizer, uh, those not only feed the Draco engines that propel Dragon on orbit, but they also supply those eight super, eight super Draco engines of the launch escape system. So I have one right here, a little model. Um, oh, it doesn't come off the stand. <laughs> <laughs> Don't break it, Lauren. All right. I, I know, it's very nice. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we, the Dragon is actually broken up into four quads, and each quad has two of the Super Draco engines for a total of eight of them. And as I mentioned, they are uh, biprop engines. They have MMH and NTO as their oxidizer. Um, now, most abort systems from past space vehicles, uh, I believe like Soyuz, Mercury, Apollo, they all had an, a pointy escape tower on top where there was essentially like a mini rocket engine or a series of rocket engines on top. And if they weren't used, those that, that escape tower would have to jettison itself from the vehicle. If it was used, it would be used to lift the vehicle off of the rocket. Well, Dragon is a little bit different in that its escape system is actually integrated into the vehicle. And that's great for a couple of reasons. One, uh, one less thing you have to jettison on a nominal flight. Right. Um, and so they're pretty dormant, just those throttle valves open unless they're used and hopefully they never have to be. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing that that offers you is the ability to escape from the pad all the way to orbit. Right. Because if you jettisoned your escape system prior to that, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's, that's a little drag in there. Again, right. new era, much safer design. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Thanks for walking us through that, Lauren, again. The launch escape system is armed. Um, that protects Bob and Doug so that if something were to go wrong, they can shoot off of the pad away from the rocket and parachute to safety in the ocean. Um, that is such a crucial safety capability. And so now we want to go over to Hawthorne for an operational update with John. Thanks, Murray. We are counting down those final minutes. Everything is still looking good on the Falcon 9 and the Dragon vehicles for an on-time launch. But weather is trending the wrong way right now. We're keeping our ears open in case we hear that uh, the weather is going to be no go for the rest of the count. Right now, we are counting down at T minus 32 minutes. Stage one locks Falcon and Falcon 9 did begin propellant nominal. load at T minus 35 minutes, right on time. The propellants we use on Falcon 9 are a fuel, which is rocket grade kerosene, also called RP1, refined petroleum. We use an oxidizer, and that's the super chill liquid oxygen, or LOX as we call it. Those two propellants with, you know, come together, but they don't light, so we need an ignition source to complete the fire triangle. For this, Falcon 9 uses a fluid called T-TEB. You might see that just before first stage ignition or maybe later in the second stage ignition. You get a green colored flame as the T-TEB comes out into the oxygen, and that ignites the main engines right before the rocket takes off or the second stage engine lights. Now currently in the fueling, RP-1 fuel is about 10% full on the first stage. That's the bottom two-thirds of the stack of the vehicle you can see on the left. The first stage is that long white cylinder at the bottom plus that black cylinder called the inner stage. That's the entire first stage that we're loading with LOX and RP-1 kerosene. That's the part that comes back to Earth. The second stage just above it, the white cylinder, and then above that will be the Dragon trunk and the capsule. Now currently, the second stage is also loading fuel with RP-1. That's about 8% uh, full right now. We are loading liquid oxygen on the first stage. The second stage liquid oxygen load will begin at T minus 16 and a half minutes if the weather cooperates. So LOX loading will then continue on both the first and the second stage until the last few minutes of the countdown. 
Helium loading is also underway into pressure vessels on the first second stage. We use that to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is being pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. Dragon on board the spacecraft. You can see the astronauts are monitoring systems while propellant is loaded into the Falcon 9. Now when we Stage flew one, cryo, the first started. demo flight last year and then the in-flight escape test earlier this year, the sounds inside the Dragon capsule were recorded. So as part of the training, the sounds of the propellant loading were played back to acclimate the crew to what they're experiencing now. I'm stopping, I'm listening to some discussion on one of the back nets, uh, trying to track uh, where we are with the weather criteria. Uh, we're just passing another weather gate right now, uh, trying to see whether or not the conditions are go. Uh, in certain situations, when the weather is no go, you have to wait 30 minutes, and we are now inside of 30 minutes. But if the cloud moves away, if the conditions improve, uh, we may be able to continue the countdown for another 14 minutes and reassess. So we're waiting to see whether or not uh, we can continue the count. Currently we are. The range, they're ready to support with no problems uh, in the air and the sea space area. Uh, but again, the weather, that's the one that's looking bad and we're gonna continue to listen. And as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we're going to have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity on May 30th. For demo two, Bob and Doug's flight to station will take about 19 hours and their journey is fairly similar to the trip our cargo dragon makes back and forth to the International Space Station with two noticeable differences, docking and splashdown. As we await T minus zero in just a little over 28 minutes from now, ground operations teams just doing those final series of system checks, making sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for liftoff and really keeping an eye on that weather. And you're just continuing to get live views of the teams. You've got Falcon 9 and Dragon on your left and then Bob and Doug on the right as they prepare at the Cape for liftoff. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until Falcon 9 and first and second stages separate and send Dragon on its way to the space station. And once it gets on orbit, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit operations, where Dragon will execute a series of burns that are going to gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the International Space Station. And you're seeing some of that track in the animation on your screen right now. After doing enough of Dragon, those burns, they'll put Dragon. Oh, sounds like we're going to get a weather update real quick for the crew. Go ahead, SpaceX. Yeah, we're currently just evaluating uh, one constraint, a constraint on the field mill rule, which looks at lightning energy dissipation. Um, we expect to have an update at about T minus 20, and uh, more information there on whether we would be able to continue into the prop load or, or scrub at that time. Okay, Jay, thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Copy. So I'll give you some more words in about six minutes. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to find cap. out in about six minutes if we're going to have enough time. And John, I was referring to a couple of those weather situations where we have to have a, a certain amount of time. In this case, uh, with the field mills, about 15 minutes. So they have until about 16 minutes and 30 seconds to really make sure that we're gonna have enough time for that to dissipate. So we're gonna be listening for that weather update in just a couple of minutes, but it is gonna be a pretty interesting trip uphill for them once they actually get on orbit. <laughs> and a very exciting countdown with six minutes to figure out if we are launching today. But t targeting back to what we were talking about, next will Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. This is a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which used a process called berthing. Now, berthing requires a spacecraft to approach the station and then stop so a crew member can maneuver the station's robotic arm to capture the spacecraft. Docking on this version of Dragon can be done autonomously. Stage two, cryohelium load started. Autonomously with no crew aboard the station. It's typically a faster process, both when arriving and leaving, but it does still require pinpoint accuracy to approach safely. 
Once captured, a spacecraft then gets attached to a common berthing mechanism. It's the same type of port that we use to connect each of the modules together on board station. It's a little bit slower process than docking, but the hatches are significantly larger than docking ports, which makes them perfect for bringing up large cargo items. And Dragon will spend up to 120 days docked before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the crew will close out the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will complete two departure burns using its Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And then after Dragon departs the station, it's ready for its trip home and that'll have deorbit entry and landing and a number, number of other operations. If you're looking at this animation, it might look like we're playing the one we played originally in reverse because that's kind of how it goes, but just a little bit quicker. Uh, all of the operations following the final departure maneuver will include things like trunk separation, closing that nose cone again, executing a deorbit burn, and once they're inside the atmosphere, deploying drogue and then main parachutes, and then finally splashing down off the Florida coast, at which team time teams will move in, get Bob and Doug up out of the water, and get them out of the capsule once they're on the boat. So. We have four minutes now until we get that next expected weather update. Let's go down now to the team at Kennedy. Murray? All right, thanks, Dan. If you're just joining us, we are now T minus 23 minutes and 48 seconds from the first launch of astronauts to the International Space Station from U.S. soil in nine years. We're going to find out in less than four minutes if the weather looks good for that. Um, and this will mark the beginning of a new era where more people will be able to fly to space than ever before. Um, in fact, we took a poll a little bit earlier to ask you if you had the opportunity to fly to space, would you go? And 86% of those of you watching answered that you would go to space. That's an incredible number. I think, you know, realizing that you don't have to be a military astronaut or a NASA astronaut to fly in space. You can be a regular civil, you know, just a regular person going up to space on a SpaceX type rocket. So I think that's why the numbers are so high. Yeah, and, and we are really thrilled to uh, to see all the folks uh, watching along online. I know we certainly hope that uh, that this is a go, but we're again, we're going to hear a little bit of a weather update in less than three minutes now. And Leland, you know, I know they're waiting for a weather update and they've come, you know, almost all the way down the count. What do you think Bob and Doug are thinking about right now? You know, we uh, on 120, SES 129, we were having some weather problems and I think we were getting close to the countdown and then it seemed like the sky just cleared up right above our heads. We saw it and we knew we were going and, you know, we always know that, you know, you can have any types of delays, fuel prop delays, all kinds of things that can happen, but we've trained over and over and over again for these types of scenarios. And so, you know, we want to be safe. We want to be safe for our families and uh, we'll, you know, do this another day if it doesn't work with the weather. I love that John I always says weather. It's that thing that everybody talks about, but no one can do anything about it. <laughs> I know. And it is this interesting thing of just, you know, succumbing to, right. to Mother Earth. She's going to tell us if we can go or not today. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, if it happens, I mean, look at it this way. Bob and Doug got one really great rehearsal in, right? <laughs> it's always best to practice and practice and practice, yes. So again, we're less than two minutes now from that weather update that uh, is going to go directly to Bob and Doug, and we will quiet down so we can listen in for that because I know we can't wait to find out what that is. And uh, those of you watching that have been following along, um, we are eagerly awaiting to hear um, whether the weather is going to be a showstopper today. These clouds can seem really deceiving at times, right? You see the blue skies peeking through and you think everything's fine, but you just don't know. That's Absolutely. why we have those launch weather officers. Absolutely. And I know, you know, we've talked about it before, but it's not just the weather in Florida that they're looking at. They've got to look at weather downrange. If they, if they were to have an abort um, in flight and they needed to come down somewhere in the, in the ocean, uh, they need to consider what the weather's like out there because recovery teams have to go out and get them in a situation like that. So there's so many variables, um, and that's why um, not just with this flight, but you know, with every human space flight we've had in the past, there's always a very good chance of, of a scrub because, because you do have so much criteria. 
that you have to meet. And we're going to listen in now. We're just seconds away from a weather update. Stage two, RP-1 load complete. That is liquid oxygen you see venting off the rocket. That's completely normal and expected. We're standing by for a weather update. Um, unless you can give us another uh, 10 minutes, I don't think we're going to get there uh, with any of the rules today. I'm mean, going to give you 10 minutes. I mean, <laughs> another 10 minutes past T0. Oh, 1640, that, 1645 local, I think we would probably be clear on all the rules, but not, uh, not quite, not quite going to make it for this. Okay. We're going to check back in with you in about two minutes, and then I'll call it up at about uh, T minus 17 minutes. Okay. Yeah, we got, we, there's some of them are starting to count down, but we still have one above 2,000. So if that gets below, uh, And that didn't sound great right there. That was the weather net going out, but we're still standing by for a final decision. And we're going to continue to listen in for an update. But in the meantime, we're going to go over to John Innsbrucker at SpaceX headquarters in California. John? And Dragon SpaceX on weather. Uh, we're still T not minus 18 good minutes currently. and counting. Uh, LD is, we uh, are still, still red on weather. Uh, expect an update from LD. We're waiting in about uh, another in minute minutes. for one final check with weather. We're going to check at okay, T minus 17 copy. minutes, possibly. We don't really expect that things will have improved. Uh, the weather officer was not optimistic that uh, the weather would clear up that rapidly. We did hear the launch director, Mike T Taylor, joke that, you know, if we uh, could move uh, 10 more minutes uh, past the T0, weather conditions may improve. But Mike was not able to do that. We have an instantaneous window today. So at 17 minutes, we want to make that call because shortly after that, we will begin loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. So if we're not going to have the opportunity to launch, launch if the clock's going to run out, that, stand by. We continue to violate a couple different weather rules that we now do not expect to clear in time to allow for a launch today. We go ahead and end uh, today's launch attempt. Launch control. Go ahead and end the launch auto sequence and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence, please. Launch board has started. And Dragon SpaceX, unfortunately, um, we are not going to launch today. You are go for 5.100 launch scrub. 5.100, it was a good effort by the teams, and we understand, and we'll uh, meet you there. Copy all. We've heard the call from the crew. They have been informed. Launch Director Mike Taylor uh, has called a scrub for the day, and we got the feedback when uh, the Dragon team informed uh, Bob and Doug. They said we gave it a good try, but they understand, and uh, we are here to try another day. So right now we did uh, officially hold the clock. It looks like at T minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. The launch automatic sequence that controls the Falcon 9, the loading of propellants, the cycling of valves, that is also stopped. We now proceed into what is a normal scrub sequence for us. We practice this every launch. So now we move into safely taking the propellants, the pressurization gases back off the first and second stages. As things get into a safe configuration, then we will uh, disarm the escape system on Dragon, and we'll bring the crew access arm back around the uh, spacecraft. 
So right now, we got down to just inside 17 minutes. The hardware was working very well on both Dragon and spacecraft. We had the uh, fuel loading going on. We had liquid oxygen loading going on, everything but the second stage. And the weather just needed a little bit more time to clear the conditions. We didn't have that time because we had an instantaneous window. And so with that, SpaceX launch director had to call upon the input from okay, weather. Dragon copies had to all call about 30 a scrub minutes. for the day per the safety rules that we have for this flight. So right now the team is undergoing the uh, post scrub operations on both Dragon uh, as well as Falcon 9 working with the range. No issues being reported right now as we start to go through that sequence. Everything looks good. And uh, Dan, uh, we had a we had a good uh, webcast going here until the very end. So uh, you know we'll look at it as uh, now we've had another great uh, dry rehearsal. Last Saturday we did a dry one, I should say, and today we've done a wet dress rehearsal. But sorry, we just couldn't get there, Dan. Yeah, thanks, John. I and. Obviously, we can't control the weather. We came right down to the wire there, hoping we could just squeeze in between those cloud systems to get a launch today, but it wasn't to be. Um, but it doesn't mean this we're done. We're going to have another attempt coming up in just three days. So we're going to be doing this all over again, essentially, on Saturday uh, on the 30th. And that launch attempt is going to be coming at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit earlier in the day, it's going to look largely the same to everything that we saw today with the crew waking up, going through suit up, making their way to the pad. So it's going to, we're going to feel a lot of deja vu, I think, on Saturday. Yep. Um, but still exciting. Um, safety is always first. So if weather was not there for us today, hopefully Saturday it will be there for us and we will have a safe launch on Saturday. Yeah, the initial weather report still had us at about, I think, a 40% uh, possibility of violation. So weather a little bit better, but we're still going to be kind of rolling the dice. It is Florida in the spring and summer, so storms are always a possibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one of the good things, though, the vehicle appeared to be in great health throughout the day, both Dragon and Falcon 9, so we didn't have to scrub for any technical issue. We're going to continue and follow along with Bob and Doug until they're out of that capsule, as again, they had started loading fuel onto the Falcon 9 rocket, so they'll have to wait until all that fuel comes off. They'll disarm the launch escape system, which still stays armed because they're still sitting on an a partially loaded rocket and then once they're able to disarm that launch escape system the crew arm will swing back out they'll make their way once again back the way they came and then it'll be back to crew quarters for Bob and Doug for a few more days But if you're just now tuning in, wondering why we're not still counting down, we did have a launch scrub today. We were just a little under Stage 17 one minutes. Stage one fuel flow rates are nominal for offload. Expecting about a 40 minute offload time. And so that call out the, the locks, the liquid oxygen fuel pumping out of the first stage of the Falcon 9, everything looking good with that. Expecting about 40 minutes for all that fuel to come off. So again, once that fuel comes off, Bob and Doug will be able to disarm the launch escape system and that crew access arm will swing back out. And they'll be able to make their way back down and then over to crew quarters. So unfortunate scrub today because of weather. That was the one thing we were tracking from the moment we started today, uh, watching Bob and Doug get suited up for their launch. Uh, we did abort today's launch or scrub today's launch uh, with a little under 17 minutes to go until our T0 time, which was 4.33. So that's going to move us to our next attempt, which is coming up on Saturday. And that time is going to be uh, 3.22 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit early, earlier in the day for Bob and Doug and for everybody else watching around the world. They're still going to have a 19-hour flight to station if that's when we launch. And a lot of the stuff that we saw today is going to look very similar. But we're just going to have to try again, cross our fingers, hope for a little bit weather, better weather the next time. <laughs> And again, this goes with every launch. We do track everything all the way down to T0 to make sure that everything is go, making sure that the range is go, weather is go. So this is standard procedure. Um, we always tend to make sure that we have a backup day, launch day, in case we do yep. have scrubs like today. 
So this is, this is pretty normal and standard, um, nothing to be worried about. Again, we do this for the safety of our vehicles as well as today we had astronauts on our vehicle. So even bigger reason for us to make sure that we have safe weather for them to fly. And just a reminder for everyone still tuned in, it takes about 40 minutes for all of this propellant to come off of the Falcon 9. And while it is offloading that launch escape system on Dragon, which is designed to pull the capsule away, if there's any issue with the rocket or anything on the pad, that is still armed. So we're gonna continue to stay with this until all the propellant's off, and then we'll see the launch escape system get disarmed. Bob and Doug will be able to open up their visors again. The launch, uh, the crew access arm will swing back out and link up with Dragon and they'll make their way off and then down the uh, tower at the pad. But if you're just now tuning in, no launch today. We did have to scrub because of weather. We're gonna be moving to our second attempt on Saturday, just a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Just gonna to continue to stand by as this propellant comes off. We heard a call that everything was going nominally or as expected so far. And then once the, all the propellants off, we should see Bob and Doug make their way out of Dragon shortly after. And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of Bob and Doug on the right side inside of Dragon as they're waiting for propellant to be removed from the vehicle so that it is safe for them to disarm the launch escape system. And this will take uh, a bit of time, so we are going to stay live with you to watch this uh, as they exit the vehicle eventually um, and come down from, from standing down on launch today. Up until the point of the scrub, we had a really clean countdown, weren't tracking any issues with Falcon 9 or the Dragon spacecraft, so always a good thing to see. We did have to scrub because of that weather. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, we were still in violation of one of the weather criteria. It was the strength of electric fields in the atmosphere that uh, the 45th Space Wing and other weather operators are monitoring around the launch pad. And that's one of those rules where we need a certain amount of time if we're in a violation in this case. Nominal, roughly 50% on stage one locks in fuel, 85% on stage two fuel. So the propellant offload on Falcon 9 continuing to go well. Uh, but we needed a little bit more time if we were going to be able to clear that launch weather constraint. And since we do have an instantaneous launch window today, we weren't able to make it. So. We hope for better weather coming up on Saturday, where again, our next launch attempt is gonna be at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll be able to go through everything. I mean, we, we saw them get suited up. They had a great ride out to the pad. All of their initial checks on both the suits with pressure checks and communication checks went well. Able to get the Dragon hatch closed, the launch escape system arm, and Falcon 9 started its fueling. Just not able to make a good weather window today. And as John I said earlier, it was just another great rehearsal today. Um, I don't think you can get uh, enough practice doing this. So when Saturday comes or when we, the day that we can actually launch the vehicle, Bob and Doug and the NASA and SpaceX team are fully prepared with just an extra rehearsal on the belt now. <laughs> And as we had talked a couple of times throughout our countdown, the weather is a lot more complex when we're launching humans. You have some more stringent uh, requirements in place, uh, not only around the pad, but uh, in the case of this launch today, we we're also looking at whether the entire ascent corridor, as we call it, so basically the entire way that they were flying up the east coast of the United States in this launch today, we're monitoring that weather because those are areas that if they have an ascent abort or basically Dragon firing off of the Falcon 9 while they're flying into space, we have to make sure that conditions are good in the sea states around those areas just so they're not going to be landing in the middle of a hurricane, which we did have a tropical storm forming right <laughs> off the coast uh, of South Carolina today just to help complicate things a little bit. <laughs> 
And people might be asking, if we knew the weather was going to be a little iffy today, why continue to count down? Um, well, that is the reason why we do all these checks all the way to count down. Uh, in Florida, the weather is, you know, pretty sporadic. Uh, sometimes a, a thunderstorm or hurricane will pass through. Within 20 minutes, it's gone, and we could have clear skies for a safe launch. Um, so as we continued as scheduled. Um, standard procedure again to just continuing to continue to monitor weather all the way down to the last minutes of the count and uh, we see what happens so today unfortunately we did scrub for weather uh, but we will attempt again this Saturday on May 30th And uh, Dan, Jesse, uh, a couple of things to add on there. Uh, right now we are 11 minutes after the scrub was called. Uh, liquid oxygen and fuel are coming off of the first stage. Uh, hard to tell from the view. Uh, it's still a little misty around the tank because there's locks on board. But we're uh, between half and a third of each of the fuel and locks tanks uh, filled on the first stage. So uh, propellant coming out uh, right per plan. The second stage fuel tank is offloading. That's going slower, but it's also a smaller tank. It doesn't take very long to either load it or to offload it. The other thing that we're working on is the high pressure helium spheres, uh, as well as the nitrogen spheres for the uh, landing leg system. Uh, the pressure will be brought down on those, eventually getting it down low enough uh, to where uh, people can re-enter the pad area. So right now the team is preparing once they get a uh, permission the uh, SpaceX uh, ingress egress technician team uh, will come back inside the uh, uh, caution area around the pad make their way up uh, when conditions are right open up the hatch and assist the astronauts uh, out of the Dragon I'd like to point out that uh, for those who are wondering whether or not having gone through this putting propellant pressurization gases on getting fairly close to launch whether that has done anything to wear out the Falcon 9 or the Dragon, uh, the answer is no. If you can recall, the Falcon 9 is designed for at least 10 flights, and about the time we get up to a 10th flight, we'll be doing testing to find that we probably got enough uh, margin to continue keep flying. So this is the very first flight of a new first stage and a new second stage. So we've not, uh, we haven't even gotten through the first flight. And in all of our margin calculations, we also take into account the fact that we may scrub a launch. So even today's operation where we have pressurized and we have stressed the vehicle a little bit, uh, that's taken into account in our design and our qualification testing. The other good thing is that the uh, most stressing part uh, of the flight for uh, the Falcon 9 on the first stage is the re-entry. So we didn't even get through that. So we're sitting here on the pad uh, it's a fairly uh, uh, straightforward situation and not stressing on the Falcon 9. And on the Dragon spacecraft, with the human rating factors to carry crew, uh, there is enough uh, factors of safety, margins of safety, redundancy, that uh, just having two people on board and closing the hatch uh, and even pressurizing the propellant system uh, does not eat into the margins of the uh, continue so nominally 30% on stage one So right now everything's continuing to offload. Uh, the automatic sequences that uh, we use routinely both at the launch sites, uh, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, even Vandenberg Air Force Base, as well as in our Texas test site for first and second stage. Those sequences are running. Propellant is coming off of the vehicle uh, per plan. And uh, we see uh, Bob and Doug uh, up in the uh, Dragon spacecraft, uh, just waiting uh, when we can get up there, open the hatch, and help them egress and come on back down the tower. And the other thought I had, uh, Dan and uh, Jesse, is uh, right now we are coming up uh, uh, on what would have been uh, T0. And I'm wondering 10 minutes from now whether the weather officer would turn around and say, yes, it turned good. You just didn't have a long enough window. We only had one second and we needed 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to ask offline and say, hey, did the uh, weather conditions improve? And one thing I'll tag on to that Dan was mentioning and Jesse was talking about the launch opportunities. 
the launch window does move earlier on Saturday a little bit. So it just happened to be Orbital Dynamics said today, if you want to go to the International Space Station and you want to launch northeast, which is the approved trajectory, you have to go right at 4.33, 35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. You pick another day, the T0 moves. Uh, it's just uh, luck of the draw. We might have been doing this at 8 in the morning when we were getting lightning, or we could have been doing it uh, a few hours from now when conditions may have been acceptable. So in the end, uh, we can all look at uh, Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler for orbital dynamics telling us when do we launch, and that stuck us right in the middle of a period of bad weather. So there's, there's my science lesson for today, Dan and Jesse. <laughs> Appreciate that, John. That helps soften the blow of just moving past that T minus zero time. Uh, but for anybody, if you're just now tuning in, wondering why Falcon 9 is still sitting there on the pad as we move past that T0, we did have a scrub for weather today, uh, just not able to clear all of those constraints. We, we keep a very close eye on the weather around the pad and our, their whole way Dragon uphill. Dragon SpaceX for weather. Right now, Bob and Doug are still inside Dragon, of Dragon. Dragon, go ahead for weather. Yeah, I just wanted to give you some more words on the scrub uh, rationale. Yeah, so we basically scrubbed due to three rules that we were violating. Uh, both, all three would have been expected to clear 10 minutes after our T0 time. And those three were natural lightning, the field mills, and the attached anvil. Yeah, we copy, Jay. We appreciate that uh, update. We can see some uh, raindrops on the windows and uh, just figured that uh, whatever it was was too close to the launch pad at uh, the time we needed it not to be. So uh, we appreciate that and understand that everybody's probably uh, a little bit bummed out. It's just part of the deal. Everybody was ready today and we appreciate that and uh, the ship was great. And uh, we'll do it again, uh, I think, on Saturday. Copy all. And yeah, we concur. And appreciate your resilience uh, sitting there in the vehicle for us. We got the easy job. Nothing better than being prime crew on a new spaceship. Copy that. All right, some, some great words from Bob and Doug. They're feeling good inside Dragon. They'll be ready to go when we make our next attempt on Saturday. Uh, right now, we're just still waiting for all of the fuel to come off the Falcon 9 rocket. After stage that, one locks and fuel roughly 20%, and stage two fuel 36%. And so that call right there, we're still at a little over 20% on fuel, RP1, and locks, liquid oxygen on the first stage and then at about 26% on RP-1 on that second stage. So again, it takes about 40 minutes once the process starts. So we should have right around 30 minutes or so until all that fuel's off. And then uh, the crew will get the go to disarm the launch escape system. We'll see that crew access arm swing back into place and they can begin to egress or get out of the Dragon spacecraft. And you heard it live that weather update of what we violated. We were just 10 minutes off, unfortunately, but again, today was an instantaneous launch. Um, and as John explained, um, it's due to the orbital mechanics and, and making sure that at the time we launch, it will allow us to get to the space station on time and accurately. So you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are patiently waiting. They do still have their visors on and still strapped into their seats. The launch escape system is still armed right now as we are offloading fuel and will not disarm until prop offload is complete. And this is just to ensure the safety of Bob and Doug and make sure that they can egress safely from the rocket. And just a reminder today, just this first attempt, we're gonna be right back here uh, looking like on Saturday for attempt number two. 
Launch America is not going anywhere. <laughs> still, still on the track to get Bob and Doug into space, and get this Crew Dragon up to the International Space Station. So it's always, it's always good if you're going to scrub. Probably rather scrub for weather than an issue on either Falcon 9 or Dragon. And we weren't tracking any issues with the flight systems throughout our countdown today. Everything passed with leak checks on the hatches and the crew suits. All the communications working great. All the teams were ready to go. So. As John and I said, always nice to have a little bit more practice, and we'll be right back <laughs> at it on Saturday. <laughs> what would this launch be if it wasn't even more exciting to try and launch today, and now we have to push it to Saturday? You really got to build the suspense. <laughs> yes. So. Hey, Dan and Jesse. Uh, another thought crossed my uh, mind while I'm watching uh, the diagram here showing fuel is just about off. First and second stage, we're down under 10%. Uh, LOX is also just about off of uh, one LOX first stage. Under 10%, yep, stage we're getting one, the announcement. Stage two fuels at 20%, stage one LOX is under 10%. So just continu continuing to come off of the vehicle uh, as expected. Uh, on the monitor, uh, Bob and Doug continue with visors down. Their launch escape system is armed, as we've mentioned. Uh, if there is anything that were happening to go wrong right now, they still have the viable pad abort means, something that we demonstrated way back in 2015 on one of these webcasts when we fired the Dragon capsule using the eight Super Dracos off of the launch pad and it splashed down offshore in the Atlantic Ocean. So they're staying there with the system armed until all the hazards are essentially removed and we bring the uh, crew access arm around them. We're standing by a minute. We're gonna listen to Launch director talking to the weather officer. And if you're just now tuning in, we did not launch today. We did have a scrub because of weather. But if, as we were saying, we are looking forward to trying this again on Saturday. Our launch time on Saturday will be another instantaneous window. So we'll have to have the weather cooperate again. And that launch time will be at 3.22 p.m. Eastern. I think our last weather update put us at about 40% probability of violation. John, I can check me real quick. Yeah, Dan, what I saw coming out of the Air Force was 40% uh, probability of violation, I believe. It's always tough because they report in terms of violation, and the optimists have to subtract that from 100% to go, hey, 60% chance, I'll plan my picnic. <laughs> uh, we were listening, uh, the uh, SpaceX launch director, Mike Taylor, was talking to the uh, launch weather officer asking about the three criteria that scrubbed us today. It sounds like in another minute or two, the lightning and the attached anvil uh, cloud rules will clear. The field so mill rule charge in the atmosphere uh, is still bouncing around. And so, hey, we may need uh, you know, several more minutes before that one would clear. So we'd need even longer than 10 minutes in the window today, it looks like, for all the rules to clear. That brings up uh, what I wanted to uh, mention a little while ago. Uh, I got lost uh, listening to the weather brief. Uh, but there are a lot of folks who are going, why an instantaneous launch window for Falcon 9 and Dragon? Now, typically when we go to the space station, when we do the mission planning, it's an instantaneous window. Uh, there may be enough performance in the rocket to launch uh, somewhere in a five minute period, but you've got to pick a time in there. But in the case of Falcon 9, once we start propellant load at T minus 35 minutes, it doesn't matter so much uh, if you can move five or ten minutes left or right because the whole sequence is scripted. We do the flight analysis assuming that the temperatures of the propellants are below a certain amount so that we know how much performance is available to the rocket, how much margin we're going to have. So essentially if you start the countdown, you know, four hours, eight hours out like we we're doing today, and you have uh, a very short window, once you get into propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes, you have to go as soon as you get to zero. We don't have the ability to stop the countdown, wait five minutes. Uh, now all of a sudden the liquid oxygen starts warming up from 340 degrees below zero in the ground system. 
and that changes how much performance uh, you get carrying into orbit, and we don't want to cut into those margins. Now, if we had had something like a four-hour window, which some uh, communication satellites have, we could actually get down to almost zero, hold the count, detank the Falcon 9, wait a while, it takes us about an hour and a half, reload a whole new batch of cold liquid oxygen and fuel from the big storage tank that we've got there at pad 39A and try to launch again. But in that case, you have to be able to launch, you know, about an hour and a half or so later after you scrub. And in the case of the International Space Station, an hour and a half from now, it's nowhere near where we need to be uh, to Dragon get to orbit with status. the performance of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon. So today, it's a combination. We start the day with Dragon, a, a one-second window. Yeah, just informing you, uh, it's But once we get inside of 35 minutes, uh, so it becomes in an instantaneous level. window for the Falcon and 9, for awareness, regardless uh, of what the uh, customer may be able to give us. So there's a little explanation for folks who are wondering why we have such a tight window. Okay, right now, it looks copy, like we uh, are uh, uh, bringing so, the last uh, bits of uh, fuel off of the stage, and liquid expect, oxygen so think, is know, just about off of the stage. The standard stuff, but so things are uh, clocking right along per the 40-minute timeline. Uh, everything looks good, and we'll wait to uh, hear that we're clear, and then when we get the call for Bob and Doug to go ahead and disarm, launch escape system, and the crew access arm will watch, come back out, center itself around the Dragon hatch, and then the Ingress team will go up there and uh, open the hatch. Thank you for the science lesson, John I. Ah, <laughs> uh, hey, no charge. <laughs> <laughs> Much we, appreciated. <laughs> we did hear a quick call to the crew there. We should be just under 10 minutes away from that prop load, prop offload completing. It looks like we're just tracking uh, uh, the RP-1. And there we, we have the confirmation, stage two offloads complete. And we should have now just the RP-1, so that densified uh, propellant, or the uh, RP-1 is kerosene. Uh, we should be under 10%, a little under 10 minutes until that's off. And then we'll step through those events we were discussing where they'll be able to disarm the launch escape system, get the arm back out there, and Bob and Doug can begin to exit the Dragon spacecraft. Still not the friendliest skies in the background. <laughs> that is Florida, though. The weather is constantly changing over there, which is why we always have to keep an eye on it through every single launch that we have out there. And Bob and Doug are patiently waiting. As you can see, that is a live view of them on the Crew Dragon vehicle as they're waiting prop offload to complete. Second stage, Prop offload is complete. We are just waiting on first stage, stage to complete. Stage one locks offload is complete. Waiting on stage one fuel in roughly five minutes or so. And again, the launch escape system is still armed. We are waiting for a prop offload to complete before they disarm that. And then they will be able to egress from the Crew Dragon vehicle. And we just heard we should be just under five minutes away from the last of that fuel coming out of the Falcon 9 first stage. And then we'll see those events start to, to pick back up and we'll see the crew arm swing back out. They've been in those seats for a couple hours now. Uh, they typically get inside of Dragon a little over two and a half hours ahead of launch. So they've been strapped into these seats for quite a while. They are custom sized though, so they're as comfortable as, and as snug as possible. Um, obviously, since they're gonna be in them for a really long time, but most importantly, when you're doing that splashdown at the very end of the mission, you, it's, it's your car seat and splashing down or landing on land is not the most gentle of procedures in a <laughs> capsule. So just really making sure that they're, they're snug inside of that Dragon capsule. But we should be a little under five minutes away from the prop offload being completed. And as Dan mentioned, those suits are custom made, but the seats are also custom fit for each astronaut as well. Uh, they do remain on Crew Dragon for this mission for almost 24 hours about. Uh, so we do want to make sure that they are comfortable. 
um, and make sure that the suits and the, the seats are comfortable enough for them to stay in that position for a while. Um, I believe when they get into orbit, they are allowed to um, get out of their seats and get a little bit more comfortable, but it, it's a long ride for them. Yeah, once once they do get on orbit, they are able to get out of the seats and actually out of their suits too, uh, since for this flight path today, they, it was gonna take them about 19 hours. So Bob and Doug will act, would actually have had about eight hours to sleep on board the Dragon capsule. So, we weren't able to launch today though. Uh, the rendezvous on Saturday should be very similar to what we would have had if we launched today, where it'll take them about 19 hours to get to the International Space Station. So they'll launch and they'll have a number of different events that we'll be able to walk you through, including manual piloting of Dragon and just really putting the spacecraft through all of the paces before it arrives at the International Space Station. Because again, this, this is a test flight. And this right. is this last test before we certify the Dragon spacecraft for regular crewed flights, which will just be bringing up those long durations, six month, maybe even a year long missions. Right. And it's, it should be a very exciting test flight because it's pretty much like an actual mission. Uh, when Bob and Doug get on the station, they will be performing um, some research while they're up there and performing tests and, and doing some final things for this demonstration mission. But I mean, just for right now, we are just gonna continue to stay with them until we see them come out of Dragon because the launch escape system still armed while we wait for this propellant offload to complete. That's just done as a safety measure. Anytime you have rocket propellants beneath you, you wanna make sure that we have a good way for them to get out of the way. And so we should be within just a couple of minutes for that final bit of RP-1 coming off the first stage. And then we'll hear the crew get the go to disarm that launch escape system, we'll see the crew access arm swing back in. But if you're just tuning in, expecting them to be in space, we did have a scrub today due to weather. Our next launch attempt is going to be this Saturday, May 30th at 322 p.m. Eastern time. And just like we did today, we're gonna be bringing you every single step of the way. It's gonna look a little familiar if you watched all of today's, <laughs> but it's gonna be just as exciting. I can imagine it might even be more exciting with all the anticipation that we've hyped this launch up for with already going through it all today. But again, the more practice we have, you know, the better off we will be. Hopefully next launch attempt, we will have a flawless launch um, and actually be able to lift off with good weather. Yeah, weather is gonna be the big thing that we'll continue to watch. That was the culprit today for our scrub and our initial weather reports already looking at about a 40 percent possibility of violation probability of violation so as john i was saying the optimists in us have to say that's 60 percent good so <laughs> we're going to look we're going to look at the the good side of this and that's roughly what we were in the days leading up to this uh, we won't have a rogue tropical storm forming off of south carolina on us on uh, saturday but Florida weather will always be dynamic, so we'll just continue to track and hopefully get a good chance, hit that window on Saturday. And just a reminder, everything else on the vehicle and for the mission was looking good today. It was just the weather, um, which as John Aya said earlier, and Lauren even referred to, to him mentioning this, weather is the one thing that we actually cannot control on our missions. So unfortunately, it did cause us to scrub today but the healthy, the, the vehicles are healthy. Bob and Doug were ready um, and they should be ready to go again with the next launch, launch attempt on Saturday. Just looking at our data, it looks like that RP-1 is just about all out. So we'll just kind of stand by for a few more moments. Hopefully we get that call soon, John I. Yeah, I was going to, uh, while we are waiting to hear the call that the uh, last percentage of fuel is off, uh, I was going to comment on Jesse's uh, discussion about it was just the weather. I think during this countdown, there were more words said about the weather than <laughs> everything else. Uh -huh. I'm listening right now to a weather discussion in the background. Yeah, and again, for people wondering uh, if we knew that we did have bad weather, you know, even from this morning, again, we do monitor this all the way down um, 
all the way down to the final minutes of the countdown. And with Florida weather being pretty sporadic, uh, sometimes we have even hurricanes coming through or, or bad weather coming through uh, and passing um, 20 minutes later and having uh, good weather for a launch. So this is why um, we continued to attempt to launch today. Um, but unfortunately, 4T0 today, weather was not on our side. Yeah, and Jesse, this is John again. Uh, I dropped off to listen to a weather discussion. Uh, they were just giving the times. The uh, lightning rule uh, went green, so we could have uh, gone without a lightning concern. Uh, the attached anvil rule cleared, but the field mill rule uh, is expected to clear at uh, 58 minutes after the hour. So that's uh, another four and a half minutes from now. So we, we were close, but we needed about 25 minutes uh, 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 later launch time. It does uh, remind me at risk of uh, offending some people, but the old saying that says, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than flying wishing you were on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Safety first always um, and making sure that when Bob and Doug do fly they are flying safely and as planned um, so again this is standard procedure for us to make sure that they do have a safe flight to the International Space Station all right well for now we're just continuing to stand by expecting the call that all of that prop has now been offloaded from Falcon 9 all right, venting vehicle tanks to Nominal TPC set points for Karingas. At this moment, the launch escape system is still armed. Once the prop offload is complete, that'll be the next step in our procedures to have Bob and Doug begin to make their way out of Dragon. LD, count that one. LD. Uh, we have the prompt here for nominal crew egress. Okay, so we're ready for launch escape system disarm. As a firm, ready for launch escape disarm. M MD copies. Uh, you guys are ready. We'll. S yeah, launch team's ready. Go ahead and uh, advise the crew. Hey, Dragon SpaceX, uh, you copy that discussion. So with that, you are go for uh, disarming launch escape system per section two of five dot one zero zero. We'll put that in work, section two, disarming the launch escape system. All right, that was the call we were waiting for, propelling off of Falcon 9. So Doug Hurley, Bob Bank, and now going to disarm the launch escape system on Dragon. And once that's disarmed, those eight Super Draco engines will be out of the mix. SpaceX Dragon uh, launch escape system has been disarmed into Alpha Decimal 3. Copy that, we concur. And showing then confirm the launch escape system has been disarmed. And Dragon SpaceX, with that confirmation, you are go to open your visors and proceed to section three. Okay, we'll open the visors and go to section three. As you heard and you can see Bob and Doug can now open their visors and get ready for exiting the vehicle. Again, they kept their visors on while the launch escape system was armed, while prop offloading was um, continuing. And that is just to make sure that they are safe. Now that there is no more prop propellant on any of the vehicles, they are safe to have disarmed the launch escape system and now are getting ready for that crew arm to swing back the hatch to open and for them to egress. SpaceX Dragon with an update. We're holding in three decimal four and we're ready for seat rotation when you are. Copy that. Uh, we'll wait for the closeout team to open the hatch and uh, verify clearance and then we can execute seat rotation. Dragon cap. Uh, 
And there's that crew arm swinging arm back started. towards Dragon. Once that crew arm is in place, they will be able to open the hatch on Crew Dragon. Bob and Doug's seats will rotate back out of launch position so that they can safely get out of their seats and egress the vehicle. And we heard they'll have what they call nominal egress, so just the normal procedures for getting them out of the capsule. That means the, uh, the same closeout team that was there to get them in will be able to assist as they come out. They'll arrive and get that hatch open then they'll be able to rotate the seats that'll rotate Bob and Doug pretty much forward where they'll be uh, in the original position uh, that the seats were configured when they made their way into Dragon. It just gets them a little bit out and under the displays and makes getting in and out of the capsule a little bit easier. They've been in those seats for about three hours at this point so definitely a long day for the crew uh, as they woke up about six hours prior to our T-minus zero had their breakfast, which we confirmed was steak and eggs, at least for <laughs> Doug Hurley. Uh, and then they proceeded through all of the suit up and the, tri uh, the trip to the pad, making their way inside Dragon where they've been for about the last three hours at this point. We were on track for an on-time liftoff uh, right at 4.33 p.m. Eastern time, but did have to scrub a little under 17 minutes before launch due to weather. So for now, we've offloaded all of the propellant off of Falcon 9. The launch escape system has been disarmed. That crew access arm is back right up next to Dragon, as you can see in that view on the left. And pretty soon we'll see the teams arrive to get the hatch open, get Bob and Doug out, and they'll make their way back to crew quarters and their quarantine. It is important to note that throughout the entire process of them getting into Dragon, uh, suiting up all of those different steps, they maintain that same quarantine that they've been in since uh, for about two weeks now, and that is specifically for events like today where we have to scrub and just go to another day so we don't want to we don't want to break that quarantine once we're putting them into that launch vehicle and that's a standard quarantine that we have for any crew members flying to the international space station uh, the current covid 19 pandemic obviously puts a little bit of extra pressure and a little bit of, of an extra spotlight on that uh, but they're following a lot of the same procedures that we have in place just to keep crew members healthy before they go and spend several months in space in an enclosed environment with just a couple of other people. Right, and it's a little bit more difficult to uh, get them help on the space station, right? So we want to make sure that they, when they do head up to the space station, that they are fully healthy. So this, again, is standard procedure, not just because of this pandemic that's going on. This is a standard procedure for astronauts to quarantine prior to heading to the station. And as Dan mentioned, this is a standard procedure to exit the vehicle as well. Uh, we did scrub today, but this is not an emergency state. This is standard procedure. Um, this is something that is practiced um, and rehearsed and made sure that we do follow our standard procedures to make sure that everything is still safe. Bob and Doug exit safely and go back into quarantine and get ready for our next launch attempt. Looks like they're getting a chance to stretch their legs, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dan, Jesse, uh, I'm monitoring along in the uh, scrub procedure right now. Uh, they're getting the goes to get the folks back to the pad, uh, the crew that'll open the hatch. So they have notified the team chief, uh, launch engineering, to return to the pad. As a reminder, around the pad, the uh, Air Force sets up, uh, Air Force and NASA set up roadblocks to make sure nobody gets into the hazard area. So they will head to the roadblocks, they'll pull them open so that they can drive to the pad. So launch director, I think, is estimating it's still about 15 minutes for the crew to drive all the way down uh, out to 39A, get up the tower, and then begin operations on the hatch. They have confirmed that the uh, purge of uh, the Dragon service section, which is nitrogen during the countdown, uh, to uh, avoid uh, you know, an oxygen leak, uh, that is back on air now. The crew access arm is on air, so they're ready for the the uh, egress team to get up into the tower. But it's going to take them a little bit still, I think, to uh, drive down the road in the vehicles and go up the elevator. But everything continuing to run per, per a uh, normal scrub countdown. 
which we have had the opportunity to practice with the crew uh, in, for example, the dry dress rehearsal last Saturday after we had done the static fire of the Falcon 9 the day before. I've been seeing a few questions, people asking, why aren't we just trying to launch tomorrow? As John and I was talking us through, there's some very specific times you have to identify when you're gonna be able to link up with the International Space Station. You only have so much fuel, which can only generate so much energy to make sure you're gonna intersect with the station, which is flying at over 17,000 miles an hour. So you're hitting Dragon one bullet with another pumps. bullet. Uh, some of our other launch attempts are able to make it Go to ahead. station, but have much longer yeah, Dragon, times. Uh, to prevent us from losing comms, we're going to be switching to umbilical at this time. I'm going to be unmerging Compound 1, uh, but we'll keep you updated here on Dragon Ground. Okay, yeah, we see the Cedrus uh, countdown with uh, a little over three minutes. We'll stand by for your next call on umbilical. Copy. The crew getting a call. They're just going to reconfigure some communications. Uh, but as to why we're not launching, say tomorrow. And core and count on one loops are merged. But when we pick our launch attempts, we we also have to take in mind some of the human factors of these attempts. Some of these other launch attempts may exist, but it would require Dragon taking in excess of thirty or more hours potentially to reach the station, which could wreak some havoc with the sleep shifts cycles, not only for Bob and Doug, but also for the crew on board station that has to line up their sleep schedule with Bob and Doug as they arrive. And uh, the crews on station and Bob and Doug will be operating off of Greenwich Mean Time once they get there. Dragon SpaceX, comm track umbilical. SpaceX Dragon loud and clear on umbilical. Copy, have you the same. Still getting good calm between the, the crew and the core here in Hawthorne. Uh, but really, just to sum it up, we pick our launch attempts for a number of reasons. Uh, not just uh, can we make it to the station, but just how long is it going to take to get there. And that's why Saturday is going to be our best option. We're going to be targeting that one at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time for our next attempt. And it'll be a little over 19, maybe a little over 20 hours until we actually arrive at the space station if we're able to get off the ground on Saturday. Right, and this gives Bob and Doug, you know, a few days to kind of shake off the nerves from today's launch attempt, uh, give them some, some more time to rest, um, and again, get ready for our launch attempt on Saturday. And if you're just now joining us, we did scrub our Demonstration 2 mission today. And as John mentioned, we are waiting for the egress team to make it back to the launch pad, uh, head up the tower, and help the crew, or help Bob and Doug, uh, egress the vehicle. Dragon SpaceX for closeout team status. Go ahead. Yeah, the closeout team has arrived at the pad and they are proceeding to the white room. Copy that. You heard that call out. The egress team is at the pad and are proceeding to meet Bob and Doug in the white room where they can open the hatch and help them exit the vehicle. Yep, and we'll continue to stick with Bob and Doug until we see that hatch get open and them start to make their way out. And then they're going to, oh, and there we can get some views once more back at the pad. You can see 
that egress team moving back in. They were wearing the, the black clean suits that we saw as they were helping Bob and Doug get into the Dragon just several hours ago. They're now going to get on the elevator, make their way back up, down the crew access arm, and then we'll get that Dragon side hatch opened. And as we saw earlier, this is a very tall structure, but that elevator is pretty quick there. So we saw them enter the bottom of the tower. Um, it should be a very short time before they make it to the top and are able to get to the white room and open the hatch for Bob and Doug. If uh, you want. And it should just be a few more moments. We'll see that closeout team make their way back into the crew access arm and down the hatchway. And again, if you are just now tuning in, we did have that scrub just about a little under 17 minutes before launch. Our next launch attempt is going to be this Saturday, May 30th at launch time. It's going to be another instantaneous launch time. It's going to be 3.22 p.m. Eastern time over there in Florida. And assuming an on-time launch, it'll be a pretty similar flight uh, that we were looking at today where it'll be roughly about 19 hours before they make that initial contact to the International Space Station. They'll get on orbit and execute a series of five different burns to gradually raise their orbit until they're just a few hundred meters below the station and maybe a few kilometers behind. And then they'll do all of the final approach initiation maneuvers. And by that point, the team here in Hawthorne will be working very closely with the team down in Houston in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. Weather for Saturday still not ideal but it's roughly what we started out with today where we have about a 40% chance uh, possibility of violation and it'll be tracking a lot of the same issues uh, with cumulus clouds and potential precipitation. We'll also be keeping an eye on all of the downrange weather. Oh, it looks like we're seeing some people start to make their way into the crew access arm now. So we should see them get that dragon side hatch open in just a few minutes. But as a reminder, we'll be looking at weather around the launch pad and weather downrange in their uh, their flight path on the way to orbit and that's always checked just in case they have to do any kind of emergency maneuver and land down in the Atlantic Ocean we will be making sure that the weather is at acceptable levels all the way until they're into space so you can see the team coming down now should see the hatch open momentarily and then we can begin to get Bob and Doug out of the Dragon spacecraft And again, we are staying live until Bob and Doug are safely out of Crew Dragon. You can see on your left-hand screen the team getting ready to open the hatch for them and help them out of their seats. And at this point, the launch escape system has been disarmed. That was done after we successfully offloaded all of the propellants. Uh, from the first and second stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. There are propellants loaded into Dragon, so the teams look like they were just doing what we call kind of a sniff test, so using a portable detector just to assess the atmosphere around the Dragon the, uh, capsule itself before they get the uh, hatch open and bring Bob and Doug out. All of this is standard safety procedures for egressing the vehicle. This is to ensure the safety of the crew, as well as Bob and Doug. Dragon, SpaceX for status. Go 
Go ahead. Yeah, the closeout team is at the white room. Uh, they are configuring uh, the crew arm for egress. Uh, expected to take no earlier than 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Thank you. It should be just about 10 minutes. As a reminder, they're in the white room. We walked through that a little bit earlier in our coverage uh, this morning. Uh, the white room name simply because of its color, and that's something that started all the way back during earlier Gemini missions. And that is literally the last place on planet Earth where astronauts are standing before they get loaded into this vehicle. It has an environmental control apparatus and a seal that it can put right up against the Dragon spacecraft just to keep all of that dust, dirt, and Florida humidity and Dragon out of SpaceX, the capsule. We're right at three hours in seat rotation. I uh, just wanted to check in with you on comfort levels. I'd say no changes, Jay. It hasn't been too bad at all. Copy all. And obviously at this point, uh, with the launch escape system uh, disarmed, we have uh, loosened up straps and gotten our feet out of the uh, straps on the bottom of the seat, so it's a little more comfortable anyway. Copy all. Looks comfortable. Right now, the closeout team just going to take a couple of minutes to configure the white room. They'll set up a, a seal between it and the Dragon spacecraft just to make sure we're not letting anything from the surrounding environment get into that uh, spacecraft, which is kept very pristine, obviously, for the crew members uh, once they're inside. Uh, they'll also they have a small bridge that just connects the crew arm uh, to the capsule itself. Just making sure they have a, a nice clear path uh, for their entrance and exit from the spacecraft. So it should just be a few more minutes. We'll see that hatch get opened and then our crew members can start to make their way out. And you heard seat rotation. They rotate the seats prior to uh, their actual flight to where they're a little bit more parallel to the ground and that just puts them directly in front of those displays. We'll see them rotate down just giving them easy access to get out of the capsule. And as Dan mentioned, we want to keep FOD out of the capsule. Um, FOD is foreign object debris, so that's basically anything that does not belong inside of the vehicle. So not just like dirt and dust, but just anything that was not meant to be inside of there, should not be there. So we are doing everything as a standard procedure to make sure that we do keep FOD out, uh, especially since this is going to uh, be another attempt and another um, opportunity for FOD to enter the vehicle. We, as they're exiting, we still make sure that we keep everything uh, basically like a clean room. Dragon SpaceX, you may hear some vehicle venting uh, in about 20 seconds. Copy.
Uh, John Hinsperger here with the uh, webcast desk in Hawthorne, in out California. We are continuing to wait for the crew to open the side hatch. We've got the camera showing uh, astronauts Doug Hurley, Bob Benkin inside. Uh, visors are up. Uh, they've gotten their feet out of the uh, restraints. Uh, gloves are off uh, in the uh, case of Doug, it looks like. And the team is just outside the hatch. Uh, they're going through the sequence right now, make sure uh, pressure checks are all good. Uh, make sure there are no uh, concerns with uh, gases, uh, be it uh, the propellants of the vehicle or just uh, nitrogen gas that we use as a purge. Uh, currently we are uh, coming up on uh, about 50 minutes after the Plan T0. To uh, just reiterate what Dan and Jesse have been talking about earlier, uh, we had a good countdown. Uh, I had a lot of fun saying there were no issues on Falcon 9 or Dragon of a technical sort. Uh, the range was ready to support. The downrange weather looked good in case Dragon had to make a unplanned abort splashdown in an escape maneuver uh, somewhere in the Atlantic. And we even had the, uh, once we get on orbit in case Dragon had to re-enter and come back early, the weather was good in the Pacific in case it had to come down. So everything was looking our way, except uh, Mother Nature, the weather. It's Florida, and we got into the uh, back end of the tropical storm that has now gone ashore in the Carolinas. But unfortunately, that left everything uh, disrupted just enough uh, to where we violated several of the weather rules, and we did not have enough time for them to go green. Green meaning where the rain says conditions are clear and you are all right to launch. We were still red on those rules, and uh, that was the uh, end of the countdown for the day. Again, we scrubbed at T minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. That was shortly before we were due to begin loading uh, the liquid oxygen onto the second stage. That was both the logical breakpoint in the countdown procedure where we could take a scrub without loading one more propellant on the vehicle. And at the same time, that was when the range gave us the final uh, bad news that we weren't going to get uh, green conditions uh, before the clock ran out of T0. So continuing to watch right now as the uh, crew works to uh, get the hatch open. They send final commands, making sure that everything's go. Once the hatch is open, the uh, ground crew can verify that there is nothing in the way under the seats that Doug and Bob are sitting in, and we will get the uh, seat rotation again, get them back a little bit more vertical. They're more on their backs right now in the launch position. So they'll rotate, then they'll help them out of the seats, and they'll come back out and uh, down the arm and off of the tower. Dragon SpaceX for status. It looks like the closeout team is inflating the hatch, CO, the the arm CO right now. Okay. Yeah, we can see uh, some folks outside the window.
All right, we've been quiet for a few minutes, but if you're just now tuning in, we did not launch today. We did have to scrub uh, today's mission due to weather. Um, we were just under 17 minutes away from our T0 time at 4.33 Eastern when the, the, the call was made. We were still in violation of a few of the weather constraints that just are really there to inform teams when it's safe to launch. Um, so we're looking at weather both around the pad and weather all the way on the way to orbit for them. So we did have to scrub. Um, since then, we've been able to get all of the propellant off of Falcon 9. The launch escape system has been disarmed. And right now the closeout teams are there in the white room. So right at the end of that crew access arm, they're configuring the big seal that goes around the Dragon capsule just to make sure its environment is isolated from all that nasty Florida weather. And then they'll be able to get the hatch open and we'll get Bob and Doug back out. Well, we're coming up on uh, just under an hour since the Plan T-0. Again, if you're just joining us, well, uh, we've uh, been here summing up for a while. Dragon uh, SpaceX for not... status. Yep, stand by for a status check. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, closeout team still working to do the hatch seal inflation. Um, expect another five to ten minutes. Okay. Okay. We scrubbed at T-minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. We violated three weather rules. The weather rules finally cleared up, but it was uh, long after the plan T-0. The SpaceX uh, egress team uh, did return to the pad. Uh, they were sent through the roadblocks uh, that surround the pad, uh, demarcating where the hazard area is. Team's up on the uh, crew arm, and as you just heard, SpaceX talking to astronauts uh, Bob and Doug. Uh, they're working the seal around Dragon. Uh, then we make sure that Dragon uh, capsule pressure is equalized uh, with the crew arm, and then we'll go into the uh, hatch opening sequence. So we've still got several more minutes. We'll carry that uh, as we go. A couple of points to bring up. Once the crew comes off of the Dragon and comes back down, goes back to uh, uh, the crew quarters to desuit. Uh, we will be Dragon leaving. Dragon SpaceX for awareness. We're going to command the vehicle into bat hatch open in preparation for hatch opening. Copy that. Okay, that's good. That'll get them into the sequence to make sure that the pressure is inside and outside. And note, this will equalize cabin pressure. Um, so you may notice something right there. Okay, thanks. So as I started to mention, uh, once everybody's off, We'll leave uh, the Falcon 9 drag and the crew arm where they are. That is in the launch support position. There's no plan to come back down to horizontal. The vehicle is designed to stay vertical. Uh, now, if we were to find something wrong during the countdown as we go through data review, that could mean that we have to come horizontal as we did uh, late last night, early this morning, as we were working a ground issue on the transporter erector. Uh, and then we went right back up. But currently, no plans to come horizontal. We'll stay vertical up to the next launch attempt on Saturday. There will also be, as is typical, engineers will go through all of the data they collected today, and then there will be a report out in what's called a Delta Launch Readiness Review, uh, probably this Friday before we get into the next launch attempt on Saturday. That's where the engineering disciplines will brief management, uh, chief engineer, launch director, mission director, the NASA customer, uh, where we stand on uh, today's countdown, 
what we learned as well as our readiness to proceed into another countdown attempt. But currently at uh, Kennedy Space Center at historic pad 39A, we're getting ready for the uh, hatch opening and the crew to be able to leave Dragon, come back down, get out of their suits, and wait to go another day, hopefully this coming Saturday the 30th. And Dragon SpaceX, uh, sure you see vehicles in pad hatch open. The AVVs are now open, and that nitrox injection is complete. Yep, we felt it and heard it, and uh, copy off.
And Dragon SpaceX for status. The closeout team is working, is stepping into hatch opening now. Copy. Uh, John Innsbrucker back here at the webcast desk in Hawthorne, California. Uh, we've got another camera up and you can see the side-by-side -side view on the monitor. Astronauts uh, Bob and Doug inside waiting for the hatch to come open. Uh, we're still in the middle of a uh, equalization step. Make sure that pressure inside the Dragon uh, is equal to the external, the ambient pressure so that when we open the hatch, uh, it just comes open uh, without any extra force. You can also see the SpaceX uh, team uh, is up alongside the capsule. Uh, they are removing essentially uh, the thermal protection devices. You know, for example, if you have a, a door handle on your automobile, uh, if you're going to have to re-enter from outer space, uh, you're gonna have to put a small heat shield over that door handle Otherwise, any kind of protuberances, uh, cavities, uh, could be subject to burn up. So they have to take their time, make sure that we get all of the uh, uh, thermal protection uh, safety devices off so that they can then get access to the mechanism to go ahead and uh, bring the hatch open. So what, you're watching, what you are watching right now on the left monitor is the uh, egress team going through the steps. Uh, this is typical. Uh, we're not hearing any chatter over the pad net that they're having any problems. Uh, they just take their time and make sure that everybody's ready uh, to bring the hatch open when they finally get there. So currently we are uh, T plus uh, one hour and 11 minutes or so since the planned launch. Obviously uh, we're still on the ground as uh, we're going through the post-scrub operations to bring astronauts 
uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Bacon out of the capsule. And you can see now, hatch is coming open. There's a view from the camera inside the capsule. You can see the hatch area. Crew gave a quick wave to the ground crew when it came open. And uh, right now they should be inspecting the area underneath the seats so that we can command the seats to rotate back into the uh, ingress, egress position, make it a little easier on Bob and Doug to get in and out of the seats. Dragon SpaceX, just for awareness, uh, they have a few more steps in their procedure and they should be calling to us for seat rotation shortly. Okay, copy that. Yep, we see them uh, working on that. And uh, just as a lead into that, we are ready for the seat rotation. So just let us know when you're ready to start. We'll go. We have the confirmation from the uh, Dragon team talking to the astronauts that they are just about ready to send the seat rotation command. Uh, again, the ground crew is verifying, making sure that uh, none of the cargo that's packed in Dragon uh, underneath the crew, uh, nothing is, is in the way, nothing came loose. You're looking at one row of crew seating, but there is, uh, you know, as we've mentioned before, Dragon designed to carry up to seven, but on this flight, for example, uh, much of the cargo that we're carrying is loaded in various uh, areas down below where the astronauts are seated. So they're just verifying nothing's in the way so that when they send the rotation command, uh, the seats will uh, pivot without encumbrance. Dragon SpaceX, we are initiating seat rotation. Dragon copies, we're ready. That call out from the Dragon Core up to the crew, letting them know 
that we are sending the command from the ground to rotate the seats, and you can see astronauts Doug Hurley, Bob Benkin rotating in their seat back to a more comfortable position to get in and out of the capsule. Dragon SpaceX, seats are upright. Um, thanks for the valiant effort today, helping us test our scrub timeline, and we'll see you Saturday. Yeah, we appreciate those words. Uh, everybody did great today. It was a great uh, practice, and we'll do it again on Saturday. Everybody uh, stay safe, and we'll talk to you in the loops. Likewise. Well, Dan, we've uh, heard it. They've got rotated. The hatch is open. Uh, the ground crew is uh, going to work to get uh, the astronauts out. The uh, SpaceX Dragon team, uh, like the SpaceX Falcon 9 team, is uh, going to be coming off of console now as we turn it over to the folks on the pad. So while we didn't launch, it was a pretty good uh, countdown and uh, scrub sequence. So we've got that good lesson learned under our belt. We look forward to Saturday. Uh, having even better results when we get close to T0. That's right. Always great when we don't have any issues with the capsule or the rocket, which we didn't today. Just had to fight that weather. And we'll be doing the same on Saturday. We are looking at about a 50% probability of violation. That's about where we were today. We did see it was all just a matter of trying to line up correctly. And didn't make it today, but we're going to try again on Saturday. Right, and it sounds like we were just about half an hour away from making the launch attempt today with weather, um, with 50% weather chance on Saturday. Hopefully we have a better day at T0 uh, for liftoff. But we're definitely going to all be back. Jesse, myself, and John I will be here in Hawthorne to take you along every step of the way. We hope everyone else tunes in also because... This is really going to be a monumental moment. We're now going to look towards Saturday for America once again launching U.S. astronauts on American rockets from American soil. With them getting out of the capsule, though, that's going to do it for us here at Hawthorne. We're going to send you back down to Florida for one last check-in with our teams there. So over to you, Marie, Lauren, Leland, if you're still sticking around, and we're going to be looking forward to Saturday. All right. Thanks a lot, Dan. Yep. Yeah, we just, uh, we're just all sitting here. We watched uh, Bob Benkin just climb out of his seat. Looks like he is out of Crew Dragon now and Doug Hurley following suit. No pun intended. <laughs> there we see Bob uh, in the foreground and Doug climbing out of Crew Dragon in the background. Pad closeout team. Uh, looks like helping them out. So any minute uh, they're going to be basically just reversing course, coming back the way uh, from whence they came. Leland, I know you had a scrub uh, years back. Yeah, Marie, in 2008 we were um, having breakfast. I, I, never, I never scrubbed while I was in the vehicle, but we were having breakfast and we got a call from the, uh, from the flight director saying that two of the, we had uh, these engine cutoff sensors that were, were bad. Two were bad, and the flight rules say that you have to have three of four to fly. And so we all said we're not going to fly unless we have them. And I think we all need to know that the flight rules are there to protect, you know, our astronauts and their families. And, and uh, you know, we got very close today. You know, we sometimes get that launch fever that we want to go ahead and just try it anyway. But we, we have these rules for a reason, and uh, it's really important to stick to the rules even in the heat of battle, even with, you know, dignitaries here. It's just, just, you know, the way that we have to do it as operators. It's also a good wet dress exercise. You know, <laughs> went through, exercised all the systems nearly to T0, which is incredible. Um, I believe this may have been the first time Bob and Doug are sitting on top of our, uh, in our vehicle with a fueled rocket. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah. For sure. Um, closing the hatch, uh, exercising the environmental life support systems, um, doing that flight 
uh, leak check. I mean, all of this is a ton of learning that, that came out of here, even if we didn't ultimately go to space today. Absolutely. So we're getting a cool view that we wouldn't have seen if they'd launched there or making their way back down the crew access arm. Um, and they are going to be turning the corner there, heading to the stairs that are going to take them down to the elevator. Passing the worm. Passing, Passing the worm. The worm. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, they're heading down the stairs now. It's going to take them down to the 255 foot level. And then uh, they're going to be getting in the elevator take them down to the ground level and we'll do it again on Saturday. It's actually very reassuring that all systems were go, you know, there was no problems with the vehicle at all, as Lauren, as you said, and it was just uh, some weather. And uh, I think if we have that same performance on Saturday and the weather gods give us some, give us some good juju there, we'll be good to go. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> I mean, we were we were so close today. It hurt my heart. If we had ten more minutes, it sounded like we would have, we we probably would have made it. But uh, just was not uh, was not to be today. And of course, we're gonna always do what is the safest thing for the crew. And as they head into the elevator, there um, we do want to go over to Operations and Support Building Two now, where the NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine is standing by. He would like to uh, provide his own thoughts. Now we'll go to him. Well, thank you, Marie. Um, I know there's a lot of disappointment today. The weather got us. But I also want to say this was really, it was a great day for NASA. It was a great day for SpaceX. I think our teams worked together um, in a really impressive way, making good decisions all along. So here in this particular case, we had just simply too much electricity in the atmosphere. There wasn't really a lightning storm or anything like that, but there was a concern that if we did launch, um, it could actually trigger lightning. Um, and so we made the right decision. We had the parameters set ahead of time, the teams worked together, and in the end, the right decision was made. I will tell you, I've done a lot of interviews over the last two days, and in those interviews, I get asked over and over again, is there undue pressure here? People say to me, with all of the attention of the world on this launch, with all of the VIPs coming, are you gonna feel pressure um, on this launch. And I will tell you, um, I, as, I've, as I've told you know, our teams, under no circumstances should anybody feel pressure. If we are not ready to go, we simply do not go. And I will tell you, I am proud, so proud of our teams working together to make the right decision um, in this particular case. We have a lot to look forward to. Um, in just a few short days, on Saturday, Saturday afternoon, we're gonna do it again. Uh, here's what we know we are gonna launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. We're gonna do that. We're very close. I also wanna say that this was an important milestone just today. We did a wet dress rehearsal. We haven't done a wet dress rehearsal with our astronauts full gear before. We've done a dry dress rehearsal. Now we've done a, dress, a wet dress. So we learn a lot every time we do these things. This is no different. Um, and we get a lot of great data from, from doing what we just did. So uh, today was a good day for NASA. It was a good day for, for SpaceX. Um, and we, we've got a lot to look forward to. So I want to say congratulations to both of the teams. Um, and let's go. Let's go get this done. I know we're up for it. Saturday is going to be a great day. Um, and here we go again. So uh, thank you to everybody for all the great work. Marie, back to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, those were some great insights from Jim Bridenstine, the NASA Administrator. Uh, the crew's making their way back to astronaut crew quarters where they're going to remain in quarantine um, until Saturday. They've been in quarantine for two weeks and there they will stay uh, to keep them safe and healthy for our next launch attempt. Again, uh, we had to stand down from launch today because of unfavorable weather conditions around Launch Complex 39A, but we're gonna be ready to do this again uh, Saturday, May 30th. The new launch time will be 3.22 p.m. Um, and our coverage will begin live here on NASA TV at 11 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Time, Saturday. Um, so be sure to tune back in on NASA television and nasa.gov forward slash live if you're watching along online. And uh, we will be back here to take you through it every step of the way. Thanks for sticking with us, and we will see you back here Saturday.